Hi, everybody. Welcome to the afternoon. Uh, I am Lynn Marie Trotty. I'm an associate professor of neurology at Emory University. Thank you. So anyway, I'm going to talk about comorbidities in IH. I told you who I am. My disclosures while we wait for my slides are um, that one, as is unfortunately always the case, if I mention any medication, there's a really good chance it is off-label for idiopathic hypersomnia. Um, so know that. Um, and also I'm a member of the board of the American Academy of Sleep Medicine. I am very opinionated. None of those opinions are official statements of the AASM. These are personal Lynn Marie Trotty statements. Oh, nope, that's my talk from later. So, <laughs> I remember my slides. So, comorbidities. So I have two big disclaimers to make at the outset in talking about comorbidities. So first is, by its very nature, the way that we define and diagnose idiopathic hypersomnia at this moment in time is as much about what it isn't as about what it is. So I'm sure you've heard this morning already the diagnostic criteria. You have to be sleepy. It can't be because of narcolepsy. You have to have a certain pattern on your daytime nap test, or you have to have a long sleep demonstrated either in the sleep lab or with actigraphy. And then the sleepiness can't be better explained by anything else. The only really specific anything else's that are listed are narcolepsy and insufficient sleep durations. It can't be because people don't sleep enough. That's a different problem. But there's a general statement about uh, not due to another medical or psychiatric or medication or sleep disorder. So part of idiopathic hypersomnia is ruling out anything else that causes sleepiness. There are a lot of things in the world and in human bodies that cause sleepiness. So the reason we have to define idiopathic hypersomnia that way is that right now we don't have a better way to do it. And so for research studies, sometimes we try to be really, really precise and only study people who have no other medical problems so we can be 100% sure that idiopathic hypersomnia is the whole problem. And that's really important for certain kinds of research. But over here in the real world, where we're all trying to live and, and manage and either treat or be treated, um, the reality of it is lots of people have more than one problem, regardless of what those problems are. And so whatever idiopathic hypersomnia turns out to be, there's no reason it couldn't coexist with other disorders. And so I'm going to talk about things that we often see in people who we think clinically have idiopathic hypersomnia, even though technically a purist might exclude some of those people from an idiopathic hypersomnia diagnosis. So just putting that out there while I wait for my slides. So, um, so everyone knows there's like the purist take, but I'm going to take a more relaxed human bodies are complicated kind of take today. My other big caveat before we start is there's a big chicken or an egg problem. So when two things are happening together and one of them is idiopathic hypersomnia and one of them is something else, most of the times we don't know the causes of the something else either. And so it's really hard to know, is the IH causing the other disorder? Is the other disorder causing IH? Are they just both coincidentally happening in the same person? Or is there one shared root cause causing both of them? All right, thank you so much. Go team. So why I talk about comorbidities? So, you know, obviously the first bullet is sort of obvious. It's harder to have two diseases than one. Comorbidities matter because they increase the burden of living life with chronic illnesses, both from a quality of life and a quality of health standpoint. I'm not really going to talk about that in this talk at all. I'm going to talk about the other, the other four, which is one, I think some of these comorbidities really might have important clues to us in terms of what is causing idiopathic hypersomnia. Too many of these things are happening too often in the same people who have idiopathic hypersomnia not to be an important clue as to what, uh, what is going on with the disorder. I think sometimes on the journey to getting an IH diagnosis, people get diagnosed with comorbidities and those get treated in the hopes it will fix the IH and typically it does not. But 
treating a comorbidity can sometimes help with some of the IH symptoms, reducing their severity somewhat. And then even if it doesn't do anything for the IH specific symptoms, treating a comorbidity can help in general to make it a little bit easier to uh, improve quality of life and, and so on, sort of the non-IH symptoms. Um, and then I think importantly, depending on what the comorbidity is, there can be real implications for what treatment we use to treat the IH itself. All right, so I'm sure there's been talk about that this this morning, and I know everybody in the room knows about IH. I put this slide together of sort of what are the core and common symptoms of IH, because these are not what I'm going to talk about when I talk about comorbidities. I am assuming all of these are fundamental to the disease, including brain fog and cognitive dysfunction. Um, although they're not part of the diagnostic criteria, they are so common in IH that I consider them part of the, the core of IH itself. So when we think about what are the important comorbidities in people with IH, or what are the common comorbidities in people with IH, there's really a couple of different ways you could try to get at the answer to that question. So one of the ways is what I'm showing you here. So this is a group of researchers in France who see tons and tons and tons of IH. They are world experts in IH, and they carefully looked at their IH patients who were sure have IH because... These people know IH when they see it, and they said, what else is going on with these patients? And so what you see is that compared to healthy controls, people with IH have more mood symptoms with anxiety and depression. They have more symptoms suggestive of dysfunction of the autonomic nervous system across a variety of different body systems, and they have more allergy symptoms. So that's telling us in a small but really well-described population, those are some of the important comorbidities. The other way you could try to get at this question is basically the polar opposite of that. This is using billing data on millions and millions and millions of people in the US, of whom about 5,000 had IH. And looking at in the 12 months before IH was diagnosed, what other things were diagnosed? So we don't know for sure these people had IH. We don't know for sure these people had the other things because the way these diagnoses were made was when the doctor wanted to get paid for doing the work that they did, they had to select a diagnosis or several diagnoses. And so this is a lot less precise, but a lot less precise on many, 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 many more people. And the reason that I emphasize that is that a lot of the same story actually comes up in both. So the mood and depressive disorders and anxiety disorders you see across both of those. Um, here you see a little bit more with, with headache, which we'll talk about. And here you see a giant, giant sleep apnea bar that we did not see at all in the other study. Um, and we'll talk about that as well. All right, so here's what I'm gonna try to tackle. Um, in the next little while, mood disorders, autonomic nervous system, circadian rhythm symptoms, sleep apnea, allergy and inflammation, headache, and what I am calling overlap symptom syndromes. So I think this is one of the most important and challenging overlaps and comorbidities that happens um, for some people with idiopathic hypersomnia. So here it really depends a lot, I think, which door you go in. Um, if you ask psychiatrists about excessive daytime sleepiness and long sleep durations, about hypersomnia, they'll say, oh yes, we see hypersomnia all the time. It is part of the diagnostic criteria of major depression, persistent depressive disorder, premenstrual dysphoric disorder, atypical depression. It's like fundamental to the diagnosis of several mood disorders. And so that tells you it's an important symptom for people with mood disorders. Sleepiness is really common in people with depression, but it's not spread out equally across all people with depression. It is very age-related, so it's the young adults who get depression who have sleepiness as a part of that. Older adults with depression are much more likely to have insomnia. And when does IH start? Well, around that same time. Um, some people who are going to eventually develop a clear case of depression will develop sleepiness as their very first symptom. There's kind of this idea in sleep that people who are depressed and sleepy don't really sleep a lot. They just spend a lot of time in bed. Um, but actually, um, there are newer data suggesting that people who are depressed and sleepy sleep a lot more than people who are not depressed. 
And the MSLT, the daytime nap test, that is one of the main ways we diagnose IH, is abnormal in about a quarter of people, a quarter of people who have depression and sleepiness. Um, people with depression have a really hard time getting up in the morning. Um, and if all that weren't muddying the waters enough, antidepressants can be very sedating. So I'm not even gonna try to untangle this because I don't think with the current science that we have anyone can untangle this. My point is there's a huge overlap here and it probably goes in both directions. And in fact, this is one, set, this is one comorbidity where I really am convinced all four directions of causality, or at least three of these four, are at play. Meaning, I know people, for sure the sleepiness came first and the depression really seemed to develop in reaction to the fundamental life changes that came along with IH. And I absolutely have seen people who the depression came first and over time they developed sleepiness as a result of the depression. I assume there's going to be some kind of common trigger that could lead to both. And sometimes it just seems like people have both and they are totally unrelated. That's my two diseases, one brain bullet there. They follow completely different time courses. One will get better, the other will get worse, and so on. Um, I don't think we're going to find a simple one direction arrow um, between these two. Anxiety was the other mood symptom that was on both of those studies. It was identified as being more common in people with IH than controls, um, but anxiety, sleepiness, hypersomnia is not part of the diagnostic criteria of any anxiety disorder. So it's a little bit different. Um, it has not been nearly as well studied with, uh, with respect to sleepiness, um, but maybe some of those same directions could apply. I definitely see people who, again, because their IH impacts their life so much, they develop some anxiety about the things they can't do, the things they feel like they're not able to do as well as they would like to do because of their IH. Um, at the same time, anxiety is exhausting, and so it certainly seems to go that way as well. There's a little bit of data specifically in people with IH that the, the worse your anxiety is, the higher you score, the worse you score on overall idiopathic hypersomnia severity. So why do we care about these mood comorbidities then in people with IH? So is this going to tell us something about the cause of IH? I, I mean, I'd I don't know what's going to tell us now. We don't know yet, but I'm sure of it. <laughs> this is a really important relationship. If we could understand this relationship, I think we would go a long way to understanding at least some of IH, probably not all of it. Many people, before they get to an IH diagnosis, have been put on an antidepressant in the hopes it will fix their IH. And I know this is a problem, and I don't mean to downplay how frustrating that experience with healthcare can be. But it is worth noting that for some people, treating depression can help with some of the same symptoms that happen in IH. So fatigue, long sleep durations, difficulty waking up in the morning. Sometimes when we treat depression, people do get some benefit on those things. Um, this third bullet point is really on this slide and every other comorbidity slide, specifically because I want to make this point in depression, <laughs> which is, of course, if you have a comorbidity and you treat the comorbidity and help with those symptoms, your overall disease burden goes down, even if your IH symptoms don't get better. I think the problem with depression is it lies to people, and it makes people think, of course I'm depressed, I have depression, there's no point in trying to treat depression because it won't fix the IH. And I feel pretty strongly it's still worth treating the depression because you can have IH with depression or IH without depression, and it's harder, given the same severity of IH, to have depression on top of it. So I think that's really important. Um, however, treatment choice is really impacted here as well. So lots of depression and anxiety treatments are sedating, so you don't want to make the IH worse, but not all of them. Um, some of the side effects of our medications for IH cause, pretty much all of them cause anxiety. Some of them are associated with things like very rare cases of suicidality. And so we have to think about those comorbidities in picking the medication. There's also, for, um, for some of our medications that are used for excessive sleepiness, particularly for narcolepsy, they have drug interactions that interact with medications that we might use commonly for depression. So definitely has an impact on treatment choice as well. So the autonomic nervous system is the part of your nervous system that is basically the background, like keeping your body running. So it's divided into two arms. The sympathetic nervous system 
is commonly referred to as the fight or flight system. This is the like I'm being attacked by a bear and so I'm going to increase my heart rate and increase my breathing rate and get ready to run away or fight the bear. It has another component though, which is the parasympathetic nervous system, which does not get nearly as much love as the sympathetic nervous system. This is often referred to as the rest and digest system. So when you are not fleeing the bear, how do you recover and get ready for the next time you have to flee from a bear? The balance of the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous systems at any given point in time, whether you're awake or you're asleep, is really important. And it changes pretty fundamentally in non-REM sleep and in, in REM sleep compared to wake. So I showed you that paper in IH that showed that people with, uh, with really well-characterized IH have a lot more autonomic symptoms than controls. This is some data from a larger study that we did a few years ago. With the help of lots of people in this room, I bet, because we recruited people through the Hypersomnia Foundation website to answer quite both people with IH and controls to answer questions about autonomic symptoms as part of um, using a standardized questionnaire. Um, and the questionnaire looks at lots of different kinds of uh, autonomic nervous system functions, and all of them actually were uh, people had with IH had more symptoms than controls. But the biggest two were orthostatic. So this is difficulty in regulating your heart rate or your blood pressure as you go from lying and sitting to standing. And so people who stand up too quickly and they either get lightheaded or their blood pressure shoots up, this is a dysfunction of the autonomic nervous system. And that was the most commonly uh, symptomatic in people with IH compared to controls. And the second, remember the digest part of rest and digest, the autonomic nervous system is pretty important for the gastrointestinal system. And so that was the second highest group of um, autonomic symptoms that we saw. It's not just IH. So there's adult data showing that people with narcolepsy type 1 have more uh, autonomic uh, kind of symptoms. Uh, these are data from kids. Whether they had IH or either kind of narcolepsy, they all had more autonomic uh, symptoms than, um, than would be expected in sort of healthy, uh, otherwise healthy kids. And quite substantial, the IH group is the highest bar with 60% of the kids in their study with IH having autonomic symptoms. Um, there's a little bit of data looking at people with IH who sleep long durations versus who sleep normal durations. And it turns out that if you sleep long durations, if that's your phenotype of IH, um, quite a bit more likely to have fainting specifically and then other autonomic uh, systems as well. So I do think this is important to understand the cause of IH, but it's, this is one place where I think we really may have a cause, uh, chicken and an egg problem, which is to say it's possible that dysfunction of the autonomic nervous system, particularly maybe the regulation during sleep, could lead to IH symptoms during the day. But I just showed you that the longer you sleep, the more likely you are to have orthostatic symptoms. We actually know if you just make people lie down a long time, <laughs> that tends to worsen the, um, the regulation of heart rate and blood pressure along standing. And so if your IH makes you lie down a long time, that might worsen the autonomic function. So it, the IH might be the bigger part of the problem rather than the cause. Uh, people with dysautonomia in general, separate from IH, have a lot of fatigue and a lot of brain fog. Brain fog is one of the biggest complaints of people who have autonomic nervous system problems. Um, and certainly those are big problems in IH. Um, potentially some of those can improve with treatment for the, for the dysautonomia. Um, and certainly just treating the symptoms in general can help. Um, this is a big impact for medication choice because many of the medicines that we use to wake people up will increase heart rate or increase blood pressure. And so if people are already having a problem with regulating those such that they go up, like a heart rate goes up way too fast, way too high when you stand, the resting heart rate is too high. If we then add medications on top of that that raise the heart rate, we can actually worsen the dysautonomia symptoms while trying to fix the IH symptoms. And so that's a really um, important thing to know about when picking medications for patients with a lot of uh, autonomic nervous system symptoms. The circadian rhythm is the internal clock we all have that tells us uh, when it's daytime and when it's nighttime. Some of us are better than others at syncing that up to the 24-hour world in which we live. People with idiopathic hypersomnia, not universally, but tend to be night owls. That's why I have a cute owl on that side. 
Um, and this has been shown whether you just ask people, like, when would you prefer to wake up? When would you prefer to, to go to sleep? But also with biological markers of what the internal clock is set to. Um, it turns out the circadian circuitry is throughout the body. So you can actually take skin cells and look at the circadian circuitry in the skin cell. Like, the skin cares whether it's day or night. Um, and so there's a little bit of preliminary evidence in IH that that rhythm in the skin cells is abnormal. And again, a little bit of evidence that maybe the problem in IH, particularly the people with IH who sleep too long, is maybe not that their 24-hour rhythm is just shifted later, but that the nighttime component of their rhythm is too long. So they're sleeping too long because their brain actually thinks night is supposed to be 12 hours and day is supposed to be 12 hours rather than a sort of a more traditional eight and 16. Also, we know night owls in general who don't have IH are really bad at waking up in the morning because their brain thinks it's nighttime when they're trying to wake up to, to exist in society. Um, and so that, for people who have IH and are a night owl, that's like two reasons to make it hard to wake up in the morning. I'm a little less clear on what this relationship is going to tell us about IH. I think, you know, there is a syndrome called delayed sleep-wake phase disorder where people's biological clock is shifted, so they can't fall asleep until late, and then they wake up late. But if they can sleep and get the sleep that they need, they're fine. They tend to be sleepy because they tend to not be able to get the sleep they need because the world does not accommodate their sleep schedule particularly well. So I think occasionally we kind of get those two disorders confused, depending on how much sleep people are able to get. Um, maybe there's a subtype of IH where the circadian rhythm is playing a bigger part. Um, but this one, I think, is, is going to be a little less clear than, say, the depression or the autonomic nervous system um, comorbidity. Shifting the circadian rhythm earlier for people who are night owls and can't wake up in the morning as part of their IH theoretically should be helpful with sleep inertia, with waking up in the morning. Um, we sometimes leave a shifted circadian rhythm alone if people's life lets them go to sleep when they want and wake up when they want, but often people can't do that, and so there's ways that we shift that so they can go to bed and wake up at the times that they need to. This one doesn't have a big impact on treatment choice for IH. All right, so remember at the beginning I showed you that slide from the billing database, like what did doctors enter in the computer after they saw the patients? And it showed that half of people who got a diagnosis of IH had gotten a diagnosis of sleep apnea in the year before. Half of people with IH do not have sleep apnea. <laughs> I'm gonna go out, I'm gonna go out on a limb there and say that that's just not, that's not the classic what we see with IH. But Sleep apnea is an extraordinarily common cause of sleepiness. And so I think some of that relationship is overstated by the fact that like we have to pick from a drop down menu and hypersomnia that's idiopathic. If you're not really familiar with idiopathic hypersomnia, it just sounds like, hey, this person's sleepy. You know, you might code that with, with sleep apnea. Um, most people with sleep apnea, if you treat their sleep apnea, their sleepiness resolves and that's great. Not everybody uh, has their sleepiness get better. Um, for some people, it's because they can't use the treatment um, because some of them are difficult to use and we have lots of options, but still. Um, for the people who are like, really, their sleep apnea is treated, they're using it all night, we know they're getting enough sleep, we know the sleep apnea is treated, they're still sleepy. And then there's sort of two schools of thought, probably both are true in different people, about what could cause that. So one is, in sleep apnea, you stop breathing repeatedly all night long. And so your brain is not getting oxygen repeatedly all night long. And so it's not that hard to posit that like maybe that's bad for the brain. And so <laughs> there's a school of thought that says like even though we can treat sleep apnea now and treat it moving forward, we can't do anything about all the nights you didn't get enough oxygen for all the years it probably took you to get diagnosed with sleep apnea. And there's some animal data that suggests that if you deprive animals repeatedly of oxygen, they will develop some abnormalities in the parts of the brain that are really important for being awake. 
So for some people with sleep apnea and sleepiness after they're treated, it's probably not IH, it's probably the sleep apnea itself. It's probably most true for people who had really bad sleep apnea. It's not uncommon for people to have a tiny little bit of sleep apnea and get that treated first and then still be sleepy. And in those people, we tend to think they had two diseases all along. We just had to treat the sleep apnea first to kind of make sure that wasn't the problem. And of those other diseases, that's when we start to think about like, well, maybe they have IH, maybe they have narcolepsy. Um, I don't think this is going to tell us much about the cause of IH. I think this is more of a coincidental relationship. Um, but not for nothing, treating sleep apnea definitely can help people's sleepiness, cognitive dysfunction, and non-restorative sleep in general. And so if somebody ha definitely has IH and definitely has sleep apnea, it still makes sense to treat the sleep apnea. Um, and sleep apnea causes sleep disruption. So for people who have IH and need a lot of sleep, Anything that's disrupting their sleep and keeping them from getting that is potentially really a problem. Um, there's a bit of an impact in terms of diagnosis because there's a couple of medicines that we use for IH where sleep apnea doesn't mean you can't use it, but it sort of gives us pause about a little bit higher risk. Um, this is a study looking at people with idiopathic hypersomnia and healthy controls. In this paper, there's also people with narcolepsy type 1 and narcolepsy type 2, but I just highlighted the IH people here. Um, and basically, people with IH have almost, are almost six times more likely to have inflammatory diseases. They're three and a half times more likely to have allergic diseases. They're almost three and a half times more likely to have a family member who has an inflammatory disease. There's sort of this inflammatory kind of picture to people, um, to people with IH, at least the subgroup of people with IH. Um, I think this is going to be important, again, maybe not for everybody with IH, but potentially for a subgroup of people. Inflammation makes people sleepy. If you think about having the flu, when people have the flu, they want to sleep all the time. You actually don't want to sleep all the time because of the flu virus itself. You want to sleep all the time because of your body's reaction to try to fight off the flu. So a lot of the mediators, the inflammatory mediators the body uses to do its job are really sedating. You can inject them into animals and make them go to sleep. Um, and so if there is a sort of hidden inflammatory condition in some people with IH, that might be driving a lot of the IH symptoms, and then that might be a treatment someday for targeted treatment. Um, again, treating inflammation um, can help with fatigue and sometimes with sleepiness, depending on the drug that is used. Um, it's a good idea to help with non-IH symptoms. It is worth keeping in mind that some medications that are used, especially for allergy, can be pretty sedating. So we want to try to find the least sedating options um, allergy-wise. Um, this comorbidity, when people have it, tends to impact treatment choice less. There's not as many interactions. Um, we don't think about it so much in terms of the side effects. So it's less of an issue from that perspective. Um, and then headache. Um, it showed up also on that, um, on that billing study as being more common in people with IH than the rest of the population. And so this was a study that looked specifically within a well-characterized IH population um, and found that 77% of their IH patients had headaches of a variety of different kind of headache types um, con compared to about a quarter of their controls. Um, I don't know that we really have a compelling hypothesis for why this is true. Um, for some people, this is probably true because some of our IH medicines cause headache. It's actually not that uncommon for IH medicines to cause headache. So that might be a piece of the story. I don't think it's probably the whole story. Um, many headache syndromes cause fatigue, and so getting those under control can help. For many people, especially with migraines, they're really sleepy either before the migraine or after the migraine, sometimes for a couple of days. And so if you have IH and migraines, the IH symptoms tend to get even worse around the time of the migraine. So if we can get people having fewer migraines, that can at least take away that worsening that's happening episodically. And then in my last few minutes before I stop and ask for some questions, I just want to talk a little bit about overlap syndromes. So, these have a lot of names, um, and um, there's a lot of sort of different ways of thinking about these. But basically, the point that I'm trying to get at here is 
there's lots of diseases that tend to happen together. And when you go to, you know, that disease's experts, you'll see a picture where, like, so I'll start with one on the left. You'll see a picture, myalgic encephalomyelitis, chronic fatigue syndrome, right? That's in the center. But, huh, people with chronic fatigue have a lot of POTS, which is an autonomic nervous system problem. And they have a family history of autoimmune diseases, as though there's some immune dysregulation. And they have fibromyalgia, which is another fatigue there with more pain kind of syndrome. And then if you go on the right, if you look in the POTS world, and again, POTS is an autonomic nervous system problem where people's heart rate shoots up much too much when they stand up. If you look at like what people with POTS have, they have chronic fatigue, and they have immune diseases, and they have anxiety, and they have the gastrointestinal stuff that we see along with some of the autonomic nervous system problems, and they have migraine, and they have... And so my point here is, depending on which door you go into, you tend to see a lot of these things traveling together in a way that we don't actually have a full rationale for, a full explanation for, other than to say like all these things are related in the body, right? So I presented the autonomic nervous system as though it lives alone in its own little world, but it has impacts on inflammation and brain function and everything else. Um, IH is a little different than these. IH is definitely different than chronic fatigue fundamentally, but like 20% of our patients who have IH meet the criteria for chronic fatigue also. And so, some of the things that you see in this sort of fatigue, inflammation, nervous system uh, overlap world are the same things I just told you are more common in IH. And so, you know, I'm an IH person, so I decided to make my own figure, but put IH at the center of it. Um, I think, um, you know, I think that overlap with chronic fatigue in about 20% is important. Um, I put narcolepsy type 2 there. I need a whole another hour to talk about narcolepsy type 2. I'm not going to do that now. Um, but you can see sort of all the things um, overlapping that we talked about. And then a couple of things out on the sides, because I didn't talk about them, and we're not really sure how they're going to fit. Um, concussions, also bad for the brain. Some people develop sleepiness that looks just like IH after a concussion or after multiple concussions. Ehlers-Danlos is a connective tissue disease where people have joints that are too mobile or hypermobile, and they tend to have autonomic nervous system problems and brain fog and fatigue and some of these same overlaps. And a few more people in our clinic who have IH seem to have uh, Ehlers-Danlos than you would expect by chance. Um, I'm really interested in the microbiome and whether the bacteria that live in and among us might be driving some sleepiness in IH as well as potentially in these other disorders. There's a little bit of data on narcolepsy type 1 patients having uh, kind of different microbiome composition than controls. Um, and then, you know, at the bottom I put long COVID um, because while long COVID doesn't typically look just like IH, it looks more like some of these other things, there are some people with a pretty clear long COVID or at least immediate post-COVID onset of a pretty classic IH picture. Um, there's a lot of money in long COVID right now. There's a lot more money in long COVID than there is in IH, say. Um, and so uh, that's okay. Um, I think we might be able to learn something important um, from that literature as well, some of which might turn out to be uh, helpful for our understanding of IH. So with that, I'm gonna stop, and I think I have a few minutes for questions. Yeah, thank you. Um, did you want to respond, actually, Victoria? I was just giving our standing ovation. <laughs> okay, thank you. All right, I think there's going to be lots of questions, but I do want to just bring in our online community, and thank you very much, Dr. Trotty. I have a question for you um, from one of our attendees online. Could the effects of long-term lack of quality sleep from IH actually be the cause or instigator for many comorbid conditions, given how, much, how many of us can recall some symptoms of IH from early childhood? So that is a great question. I think the... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tease apart the first part of that question first, which is to say 
I don't actually think we know what is wrong with nighttime sleep in people with IH. So sort of by definition, people with IH have to have enough sleep. So they can't have a problem of such bad sleep at night that they can't get the sleep that they need. Um, and in general, people with IH tend to sleep using our standard metrics, right, those horrible EEG wires on the head, as well or better than healthy sleepers. And so at least to the sort of the naked eye with our common tools, nighttime sleep in IH looks fine. So there's sort of this unresolved question about is IH a problem of nighttime sleep and people feel so bad during the day because of their nighttime sleep, or is IH a problem of daytime sleepiness despite nighttime sleep being fine? And I think that's a fundamental unanswered question. So before I just accept the premise of that question, I just want to pause and say we actually don't know if the nighttime sleep is the problem. But yes, I think it is important to know that for some people with IH, they've had the symptoms for a really, really long time, since childhood develop them later. We like to try to use temporality in medicine. We like to use in epidemiology. We like to use the idea that like if A happens before B, then like A might have caused B, but B didn't cause A, right? Like we, we like to believe that the world works linearly like that. Bodies aren't always <laughs> linear like that, meaning just because the sleepiness is the first thing doesn't necessarily mean that the IH was the cause of something that happens later. It might have just been the first manifestation of a comorbidity that happened later. Thank you. I think I see hand. Okay, I'll take your question. Um, I wanted to ask about the autonomic um, system. Can you speak to the commonality of the issues of temperature dysregulation and um, related to food hunger and lack of satiety, satiety and that dysregulation? I don't hear much about those two things specifically and what, if any, treatment there is for those. Yeah, so, um, so you're right. The, the sort of the, the autonomic nervous system symptom that we tend to talk about in mo most in IH is the, is the lightheadedness, is the difficulty with position changes. But the temperature changes are actually not particularly un uncommon to have issues with temperature regulation um, and a whole variety of gastrointestinal um, related symptoms as well because the autonomic nervous system is what is making all of that, um, making all of that run. Um, treating autonomic nervous system problems um, for many people at this point in time is symptom-based, meaning if you get lightheaded, uh, when you stand up, you know, wear compression hose, get salt and water, stand up slowly. If your heart rate is, is too high, put you on a medicine to lower your heart rate, right, and so on. And so for lots of people, they're, they're symptom-based like that. And so then trying to find something, it's hard for the temperature control, um, but for the GI side effects, sort of medicines that are used for other GI disorders to see if they'll help with the symptoms. There are a group of autonomic nervous system disorders where it looks like they are really an autoimmune problem. And so then traditional treatments that we use for autoimmune problems um, can be used to help the autonomic nervous system function as well. And I'm, I'm aware of one case report of a person who had IH and a lot of autonomic symptoms and they found one of these immune causes and they gave them a treatment called IVIG, which is an immune modulating treatment, and their autonomic nervous system symptoms got better, but their sleepiness got a little bit better too. Um, those are not treatments that are gonna be available for IH, generally speaking, because they're expensive and you need to have a particular diagnosis to get them, but it does seem possible that if once, once we can get targeted treatments rather than just symptomatic treatments for the autonomic nervous system dysfunction, it might cause some improvements in IH symptoms as well. Um, I can't say it's a thing I see a, a whole ton of. Um, I'm thinking back. I, I wouldn't say I, I do, although on the other hand, it's not, <laughs> 
asking doctors like what they see in patients is fundamentally dependent on what patients will tell. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know that actually, I, I certainly never ask people that. And so that's on me. I don't know how many people would spontaneously tell me that. Yeah. For the MRI study you did, hmm? were the findings on that finalized or anything like that? So um, we did a study a few years ago looking at um, people with IH and people with narcolepsy type 1 and then non-sleepy controls. We published the findings of the PET scan part of that study, um, basically showing that the pattern of sleepiness in people with narcolepsy type 1, the, the activity pattern um, in narcolepsy type 1 and the activity pattern in IH are overlapping but different. <laughs> there were some areas, actually quite a few areas where narcolepsy type one was different than controls, but there were a couple areas where IH was different from controls and different from narcolepsy type one. So from that we in, in, infer that we're not just seeing sleepiness when we do this kind of imaging, but we're seeing something more specific to the underlying disease process, right? We can tell the difference between IH and narcolepsy type one the, um, the MRI data are hopefully close to being finalized. Um, we uh, are seeing uh, sort of a similar story with those, that the patterns that we see across all three, di all three groups are, are different. And so it's, um, I think, a helpful way to say, because lots of studies have been done on narcolepsy type 1 versus controls, and they say, wow, these brains are not normal, but it's hard to know if that's only sleepiness or if that's the narcolepsy type 1. So the fact that we see different patterns in IH from narcolepsy type 1 says it's not just sleepiness that we're imaging, it's, it's something about the disease. Um, all right, Todd, I'm going to give you the last question, and then I have to let the next speaker come up. differentiated two types of uh, IH, long sleepers and short sleepers. And I'm not talking about height. Um, <laughs> then when ICSD-3 came out, the uh, designation was taken away. And that caused an enormous amount of consternation. And now the um, idea is coming back into vogue, particularly in Europe, where they're advocating 24, 36, and even 48-hour um, MSLTs. What is your opinion about, is there a difference in your mind between the long sleep episodes and the short sleep episodes from an etiologic standpoint? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, obviously, fundamentally, nobody knows the answer to that question. That seems like a really important difference to me. Um, there have been a number of groups now who have looked at that difference, and it's not just the long sleep that differs between those two groups, right? There's more sleep inertia in the long sleepers. There's, you know, there's, there's more dysautonomia in the long sleepers, right? There the two groups really do seem pretty fundamentally different. Um, my, my personal belief is that if we took everybody who had IH, whether it was long sleep or short sleep, and we took everybody who had narcolepsy type two, and we threw them in a bucket, and we mixed them around, and then we had a way to separate them out biologically, we would have a, at least about three groups. They just wouldn't align with our current MSLT-based uh, definitions as well. But I think one of the important features probably is going to be sleep duration. I think that's fundamentally important. So with that, I thank you all for your attention. Thank you.